Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm ho- co-host Lauren Brown, and I'm joined by uh, co-hosts Mia Araujo and Eric Wilkerson. Eric is painting um, something beautiful right now, so he will be painting, but I assure you he's paying attention. I hope he's paying attention. Well, what, what, what now? What Fingers now? crossed that Eric is paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but today, we're going to talk about career advice that we wish we had when we first started our careers. And if anybody's listening to this who's starting out their careers, um, please try your best to listen to this advice. I know that we can be stubborn and we can be set in our ways or we can be, we can think that, you know, it's like actually like, it's probably fine if I pull a few all-nighters or it's probably fine if I take this job that's not paying me enough. But I promise you, you you don't, please listen to us. And, um, you know, and if you don't, then, you know, maybe you have to learn the lesson yourself. But either way, we're gonna try our best to help you not do those mistakes that we fell into. So let's get started. Mia, what is <laughs> the first piece of career advice that you wish you had when you first started your career? I mean, I think this one's kind of not really my fault. Cause I mean, when we were at art school, like the first year, I, was, I think I was like 16. So it's like, I, I don't know anything about the world, but I, I guess I just kind of wish that there was a class where they broke down your finances for like finances for artists, you know, and like, oh. This is the state you live in. You live in California. It's really freaking expensive. Here's how much rent costs. Here's how much every one of these bills are. And like break it down based on like, this is how much you should be making. And this is how much each of these jobs pays. And yes, you might want to be a gallery artist and making like making your own way in the world. But this is how much you should be making per month if you're going to survive and that mm. kind of thing. Uh, man, I feel like that would have been such a lifesaver. And I wouldn't have gotten into the debt that I got into early in my career and things like that. So, and there's actually now on Twitter and stuff, I'm sure it's easy to, to find, but there's tons of like these freelance calculators, like spreadsheets people have made where you just like enter in the amounts of how much everything costs and it breaks it down for you, like how much you should be charging per hour and stuff. And I wish I had that at the beginning of my career. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would have been amazing. Obviously, like we didn't have the vast like network you know, when we were starting our careers that people have now, but we definitely, um, I mean, like art school did not prepare me for what all of this was like anyway. And, um, and, you know, like the idea of student debt just weighing you down after you left college and the interest that accrues, I didn't know anything about interest when I was younger, um, you know, about the taxes that you have to pay when you work freelance or when you take on any kind of independent contractor type job or what you could write off, um, you know, as by virtue of just being an artist, you know, there was, there was so many things that were crucial information that should have been included in natural training of being as, you know, an artist. And it was all focused on, you know, actual creation, but none of the actual business side of it. And um, that's a really good place to start. Like we could have a whole episode just about that, honestly, (laughs) seriously, Um, and maybe we should, but um, I'm curious, Eric, what was your, do you want to add on to that? Or do you have a piece of advice that you wish you had when you first started? Well, I'll I'll add on to what Mia was saying, because uh, I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City, and I took a business of illustration course. Okay. And there were there are schools that didn't have that, mm-hmm. um, you know, back then. And I, I the the instructor was a working illustrator. Like sometimes right in the middle of class, he'd be talking to his agent, like, oh, "Hold really? on," yeah, like, "Yeah," and he. Not to go off on tangents, but. He, the thing I, 20 years later, I remember he would always say, you got to make sure that you are putting aside your monies into separate accounts. And he would always use the word monies. I hated monies. that. Monies. Like, it's <laughs> money. Myself. It's money. Just call it money. God damn it. Just, <laughs> like, it's not monies. Like what, what, what country are you from? But anyway. Money for a century. But... It's money. Century. Right. But uh, yeah, but he was all about uh, letting us know about contracts, negotiations, um, like all of the things that you need to know. Uh, like everything you were talking about, Mia, about what your rent is and, and setting, setting enough money aside 
uh, when you get paid for a job, like, okay, if your rent is this much, then you know that, you know, this job or however many freelance jobs you have lined up is going to cover your rent plus utilities for X amount of months. So you have a cushion. Don't, don't go, I think that was like, that was thing number one was when you get paid, don't go out there blowing it on random junk, you know? And he was speaking from experience when he got his first Time Magazine cover or whatever, and it paid a couple thousand dollars and he went out and bought a bunch of sneakers and all this stuff. And then, you know, all these glamorous things that he, he never had. And then when it came time to pay the rent, he was freaking out. So yeah, that's, a, that's for starters, um, you know, the, the finance part of it. But there are books. There's a book from uh, Marshall Arisman, who's the, uh, I think he's the head of the master's program of, Illust master's of illustration program at SVA, uh, has a book called The Business of Illustration. Yeah. Um, that goes into a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, think of it like a textbook, basically, for any illustration student. Um, I'm still surprised to this day that people aren't aware of the Graphic Artists Guild uh, Pricing and Ethical Guidelines books. I don't know if they still publish them, but there are PDF. They still, the, the, the Graphic Artists Guild is still around, and you could go online and just buy the PDF version of it with up-to-date information on contracts, templates for uh, invoices and all of that stuff. And people just go out into this as the, a career and have no idea mm -hmm. what they're doing. And, you know, fumble through. And I fumbled through uh, initially and uh, had, had a, a friend hand me a copy of that book like here's the guidelines this is this is this is your bible you know you live by this so if somebody comes to you and say well uh we want you to do this illustration job for us we don't have a lot of money but you know or can you do it for x amount of dollars you go look it up in the guideline and go well technically it says that you should be paying me a thousand bucks you guys need to get the hell out of my face yeah. so <laughs> there's that um as far as career advice uh, the best well i've been given a lot of different advice over the years and uh from both staff and freelance uh, perspective. So I'll, I know there's a lot of people out there that want to be staff illustrators, uh, staff artists. Like a studio artist? or a studio. studio. I call it staff, <laughs> a studio. You want a studio job. You want to be in that cubicle. You want to, you know, go to lunch with people and listen to their stories and uh, <laughs> sounds so gross I actually really love that part about it <laughs> it's great I like being around people I uh I, I I did that I did that nine to ten hour shift that uh at a game studio or animation studio having to listen to people talk about their lives yeah maybe I was just in the wrong places because I was like I don't want to talk to none of y'all <laughs> Like, like those were my friends <laughs> yeah but i had a, a a friend of mine that worked um i think it would, might have been for ea uh, but he was telling me if you're going to apply to a studio as a concept artist or an illustrator apply to a studio that does the kind of work that you would love to do like if you and I tell my students this, this, I tell my students the same thing, just because you want to be a concept artist doesn't mean you just blindly go applying to any ad that says concept artist. Mm -hmm. Because what if the company just does My Little Pony games or race car games and your portfolio is full of stuff that would make you like perfect for, you know, some ultra violent horror game or something like, yeah, you could submit, but you're not going to get that job. Mm -hmm. And, and, and God forbid, like if you did get the job, like if everybody else sucked and they took a chance on you and said, well, his portfolio is full of uh, 
zombies and gore, but I think he could nail that My Little Pony illustration. And you get that job, you'd be miserable. 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 And then and then be conflicted because your parents will be happy for you. And you'd be like, you're making how much money, baby? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And now you can't quit. <laughs> and you can't quit. And then you say, well, I could power through for a year. You get that car, you get that apartment. People start coming over, looking at y'all like you got some money. Then you're like, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be here. All right. Live that life. Lived it a couple of times and it ends badly. <laughs> yes. So that's 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 for staff, but I'll come back to uh the yes. freelance. I'll let y'all do your thing. I mean, do you want to continue on with the, the staff? Um, no, because I, if I continue with the staff, I'm going to bash. I'm just going to oh. bash and like say I mean, the wrong thing. It's fine. <laughs> it's, I don't No, care. but it's like I everybody's everybody is different. Everybody's experiences will be different. I just, I don't know. If, if, if the personality types are so polar opposite of mine, I can't, I can't be around them for like, I need to be alone. Yeah. I realize that. I realize that there, there's some people that uh, choose a, a, a profession where they're, you know, a solitary lifestyle where they're just doing it because they enjoy the work. And there are other people that do it because they know that they would just get, continually get fired if they <laughs> applied for jobs around other people i'm one of those so um yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's funny because um yeah like if the personality type has to be aligning with how like the kind of people that you actually want to spend time with um when i first got into the animation industry i found that the people who were alongside me doing the work felt a lot like the people who i went to college with who the people like the people who i became really good friends with so it was very easy adjustment for me to go into the studio and I'm like, oh, this feels really similar to school or hanging out in the animation building. Like I already know this personality type of people. So it was very easy for me to make friends because I'm like, oh, you all are nerds about, you know, animation and, and Disney movies and, um, and, and Ghibli movies and stuff like that too. Like this is perfect. Um, so we had a lot to talk about and, you know, that we would have game tournaments in the studio and stuff and just like be able to share all of our interests and have a great time but um for people who are staff artists um <laughs> i i wish that um and i don't even know what i could have done about it when i was younger but when i first got hired it was um it was at floyd county and i was not making very much money but i thought it was a lot of money just because i was really excited to have a full-time job for the first time um I didn't realize that I was getting underpaid by um, $2, which was a lot back then. I mean, it still is, you know, just in relative of what everybody else was making, but also that I was continuously underpaid um, when I was a, uh, a director, even a background director. So just the amount that I wasn't making and the, the way that I was treated and um, the amount of hours I had to work to really, you know, feel like I was getting that return and to be able to survive over hiatus. There were conditions that um, that shouldn't, like now that I'm out of it, should not have been acceptable. And I feel like if anybody had told me the kind of standard that I should have as an artist working in a studio, I would not have put up with it and have tried my luck somewhere else. But I probably at that age would not have the confidence to think that I was good enough to just be accepted anywhere else. So um, so it's difficult to get that advice because I know what that feels like when you're just out of college and you just need anything. Um, what I will say is that it was a good experience to cut my teeth on and to understand how hard it could be so that once I went to better, I could feel how much better it was. But it's, a, it's usually a red flag when, um, you know, when a studio is not willing to pay you the same amount as your peers. So I guess what I will say is if you find a group of people that you trust, don't be afraid to talk about how much you're getting paid because the inequalities will come out really quickly. And it'll it'll tell you just how much you're probably supposed to be paid, especially if you're in the same role as that person or in the same, if you 
got hired on the same standing as that person. Um, because I can say with confidence that I was hired. Um, I, I had graduated grad school, so I had an MFA. And I was hired at the exact same time as um, a person with a BFA. Um, and they were getting paid more than I was. And they were male. So that, you know, that kind of being able to speak out loud about that would have brought that to light for me way sooner than the four years that it actually took me to realize how little I was paid compared to my coworkers. So, um, so that is what I will say uh, as my piece of advice for a staff artist, first and foremost, make sure you're transparent about your pay. And I know it's unco it seems uncomfortable, but the only reason why it's uncomfortable is because the, the studio culture, like the professional company culture has made it uncomfortable. It made it taboo to talk about even because they don't want other people to know how much other people are making because that means that the inequalities will come out. So it's actually a way to keep you in the dark about what you should be making. So don't subscribe to that kind of notion. Find people that you trust and be okay to talk about it with other people because that will help you realize. So that's my first piece of advice. It got back to finances, but I think it's really important. Yeah. There's a, a great uh, uh, college commencement address by Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. I, I highly recommend anybody watching this to go look it up, but he like breaks down this kind of chart of like good artists to like, you can be like bad at your job, but a good person or you can be, uh, you know, a terrible artist but a good person. Or you could be a really good artist but a terrible person. And like, like all of these different ways that it could work out. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> but uh, I forget what the point of it was because it's such a it was such a it left such an impression on me that I forgot. <laughs> but <laughs> that seems like the opposite of what should have happened. <laughs> right. No. But it was it was really good because I think one of one of the takeaways was. Uh, if you're a horrible person to work with, it doesn't matter what the quality of your art is, uh, they won't keep you around. Like you, you, your career will be short-lived. So the one thing I can say, um, not because people were like, Eric, stop being a jerk. It's, you know, be nice to everybody, mm -hmm. you know, just be like, if you're, if your work is good, just try to be nice to everybody if you're miserable where you are in life or in your place of work, find a new place of work. Find something in your personal life that that uh, brings you joy, and uh, you know, focus on that rather than to come to some place you hate, sit there, and let everybody know that you are miserable, and then take it out on them. You know, because it doesn't matter at that point how well you do your job or how good your, the end product is that you produce. If like you radiate the wrong kind of energy. So that's another uh, studio uh, bit of advice, but. Yeah, it's, um, a, yeah, it's a simple bit of don't be an asshole. Don't really be an important. asshole. Because this world, this industry is way too small for you to be yeah. an asshole. And this honestly goes for any, like whether you're studio or whether or not you are um, uh, independent. Mm -hmm. You, like people that you meet at, you know, conventions, gatherings, retreats, anything. If you are a jerk to them or if you treat them poorly, that word will get out one way or another and people will find out about you and people will not want you coming to their shows. People will not want you in their studio. People will not want to work with you. People will not want to hire you because some way or another that those group of people or that person will turn up somewhere else in your life. Mm -hmm. And you do not want that to happen to you because you will get blacklisted yeah. and you don't want to be blacklisted. No, so, and we've seen it happen more than once last year. Many times. I mean, like, and the, and the ripple effect happens like instantaneously. It's not like a couple of emails months later where they say, oh, well, this person's not too good to work with. Here's the link on Twitter where you could just follow it live where everybody's coming out saying how much this person is a jerk. So I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Like you, you don't, don't want to be a part of that. You don't want to be the, the, you don't want to be that person. So yeah. 
it rang true always obviously but like especially now that everything is so connected it's like it's definitely ringing true um because that it will follow you anywhere you go and people will like dig stuff up too which i don't you know like that's another thing but it's, it's just try to be just be kind to people just understand like even if somebody's a jerk to you try to control like if you need to have a moment to vent and breathe you know that that's their problem separate yourself from the situation go in a room steam it off calm down do your job but you do not want to be known as the person who had an outburst in the middle of the studio floor or you don't want to be the, the person that has a petty outburst online or something like that and like everybody's like seeing you you know for who you are because you couldn't control yourself like that's um you don't want to do that so don't be that person <laughs> Because that, that is very hard to unstick from yourself. You have to make a lot of amends in order to unstick a bad reputation from yourself, especially in an industry like this. So don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Mia. Um, <clears throat> oh, go, yeah, go, Mia. What? Actually, what you guys were saying made me think of the other piece of advice that I, I wish I'd had, uh, which was uh, that I think I've said this a few different ways before, but it's like, I, I was such a shy kid was growing up and just thinking if I just draw well enough, I won't ever have to talk to people. <laughs> I can somehow just make my art and put it on the world and somehow make a living. Like it's so childish and, yeah. and honestly, I'm glad I'm not that person anymore <laughs> because I've, I've come a long way since then. But I guess like the delusion there was, especially as a really shy art, art school kid is like, art is for introverts and somehow I'll get to st still be this way. And I won't have to learn these like skills, like interpersonal skills and stuff like that. And like emotional intelligence of dealing with other people and stuff. And that's the thing. It's like, if you are painfully shy, as painfully shy as I was, I would dare you to put yourself into situations where you have to learn how to get out of your shell because I feel like I learned that so late and I feel like I'm still catching up, you know, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and unfortunately, like, I think it's the same thing even with writers where they they think like okay I can just write a story and it, the story just has to be good and what I look like or what I'm like doesn't matter but actually as we've heard from your friend Tim Eric uh, that it's like you have to go out there and market the work yourself and you have to sell the book yourself and you have to be mm -hmm. likable and real and all these things and it's like it's kind of I, I know like younger Mia would have been really depressed hearing that <laughs> because that sounds so daunting but it's just I guess I'm trying to figure out how to put this in a way that sounds less daunting, but just, I guess the sooner you can work on these skills, the better. Um, yeah. and it'll take time, but, but honestly, don't, don't do what I did and just kind of wait for years in this like hermit hole and just, you know, hire other people to represent stuff for you and then have to learn those things yourself anyway. And yeah, I don't know if that's making any sense, but no, that totally makes sense that you, well, I want to just touch on the, <clears throat> The emotional intelligence part of it, where you were saying like you didn't know how to handle yourself in certain situations yeah. uh, because of your introverted like shyness. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've, we've kind of touched on anxiety before in the past, uh, in past episodes, but I think for a lot of my, I realize now uh, after you know, years away from it, that my studio experiences were uh, most likely uh, heavily affected by my own anxiety, like just being around that many people, that many different personalities, not knowing how to approach or talk to certain people um, because I didn't have anything in common with them yeah. or didn't think I had anything in common with them, didn't know how to start conversation. I'd be the guy at the party like, Hey, so oh, like like like, leave for, <laughs> like, leave, like just embarrassing myself and then going, oh God. I hope nobody saw that, like sweating my way out of it. So not knowing how to uh, express myself and then, yeah, just, just staying in the corner, Yeah, you know, uh, that, that, that did not go over well. So, um, but anyway, that's, that's life. That's living, you know, yeah. you learn. I was grow, so, so much too. I, and I remember I was started like in the ga early gallery days, I started going to a show every, every Saturday. I'm sorry if I'm telling this story over again, but every Saturday I would force myself to go to a gallery show. And if I talked to one person, I could go home, but I could not go home until I talked to somebody and it had to be somebody new. 
it couldn't be the same you know the photographer and I that was like at every one of those shows like he and I became good friends because I would always gravitate towards him but um but yeah I'd have to talk to one new person every time and it was it was painful and I was not I was I was definitely awkward like all the things you said I was like oh that was me but I think that helped a lot, you know, and obviously serving too, like being forced, like my paycheck was on the other side of talking to strangers and being yeah. dreaming and, and getting them to ugh, just like, <laughs> it was really hard, but it was, it was, I don't regret it because it's so useful. And I guess what I, the point that I was trying to make with that is there's so many skills that, that kind of keep our careers going that rely on those. There's so many things that rely on those skills is what I'm trying to say. And networking is one of them and we can talk about that on a separate episode but even just like knowing how to talk about your work in a concise way and get that story out there um all those things like people like if you're successful people want to interview you they'll want to ask you questions about yourself and your work and stuff like that and so these are all skills you will have to like learn at some point but i would just kind of take them one step at a time or just you know force yourself to do little things here and there that that might like you know push those skills if that makes sense yeah and like, mind you, there are some artists who have found great success while staying hidden behind all of their artwork, but that's very rare. And they have to be really, really good yeah. for their artwork just to speak for itself without having a face behind the name at all. Um, that is like the bare minimum of artists. So it's possible, like if you're super shy and you really don't think you can overcome it, then make sure you get really good make sure, or at least your work stands out on its own because, um, Otherwise, you're going to have to represent your art in some way or another, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to find a way to present yourself and your art to an audience of people, um, you know, especially if you're planning to do conventions or planning to do anything in person at all. Uh, you want to make sure that you can speak to it in, in some form or fashion. So it's a really valuable skill to learn, even if it's very uncomfortable. Unfortunately, this world is not catered to introverts. Mm -hmm. So it's you have to find a way to adjust to that this world as an introvert. And, you know, I'm an introvert um, and I'm lucky enough that I'm, I can, you know, kind of go between the fence depending on what day it is, but um, it's still, it's still tough sometimes to put myself out there and to think that I'm not good enough to be going up to this person and talking to them. How could I, but it's just like, try to pretend that you have that confidence and then maybe one day you'll actually have that confidence to just feel okay about doing that. Um, yeah. Again, it's like cosplaying a confident person is, is often what I do. So I just, I fake it until I make it. <laughs> Learning how to sell yourself. That's yeah. like, if, really they, if you could tell somebody, if I could tell somebody something in, you know, now looking back, um, learning how to sell yourself. Hi, my name is, this is what I do. I'm really good at it. Buy my stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And um, my first convention was in 2014. 2014 it was Gen Dragon Con. Dragon Con. Um, I mean, I just went all in. Like, I didn't try one of the regional things. I just drove all the way to Georgia and uh, super nervous, super nervous. Like, I had like prints just flat out on the table uh you know just sat at my booth nervous didn't really know what to do and I just kind of watched every other person around me like making money like hand over fist I'm like what the hell is going on here I thought you just sit here and just like let them come to you yeah. but it's all in your facial expression you know you can't like I never understand comic book artists or people at these comic book conventions having a booth and then they just sit there and draw and they're 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 looking down. They they look like they could care less about being there. Like, why did you buy a table just so that you could sit there and draw and mm -hmm. not make eye contact with a potential buyer? But um that courage to even do that, uh, not to like segue again but it's it's uh it, it was liquid courage actually um <laughs> my my so in beacon new york if there's anybody from anywhere around the hudson valley watching this uh beacon new york used to i don't know if they still do it today but 
uh, second Saturday, there were events on Main Street where you could go to all of the different galleries. All the different galleries had a like wine and cheese events. So they, you know, all the different uh, gallery openings. So me and my friends would go for, start on one end of Main Street and by the other, by the, by the time we got to the other end of Main Street, we would be wasted <laughs> and oh <my> full. <laughs> But we talked to everybody along the way, like talked to the artists, talked to mingled and everything. But that like got me out of my shell a little bit, but I had to be lubricated. <laughs> so when, by the time I went to Dragon Con, I kind of had to realize, okay, the same kind of excitement or energy or whatever, you've got to bring that and be able to just say to somebody like, this is what I do, you know, and um, be confident, yeah, that, that having that confidence. Um, one, one other thing I wanted to say, uh, as far as a freelancer, as far, as far as really any job, it's any job, doesn't necessarily have to be about art. Uh, it's being passionate about what you're doing. Yes. All right, if, if I... Uh, I, I tell I tell this to my students. I tell this to when I am in uh, when I do like school lectures. Uh, find something, find some kind of career, whether it's art related or not, that you are absolutely passionate about. That you would do, even if money were no object. If, if money didn't matter to you, you could just roll out of bed and do that thing. What would it be? And do it do it well and just live and be happy, right? Uh, don't put anything in your portfolio that you wouldn't want to paint all the time. Mm -hmm. that, you, I dare you to find a dragon in my portfolio. I dare you. <laughs> you want to paint dragons? Dragons are awesome. I'm like I Todd would Lockwood already did it. He did it. <laughs> it's, put, it's done. He put the stamp on it. There's nobody doing dragons better than that. Nobody. I want to paint all the scales. That's just too much. Yeah. All the <laughs> scales. See me when I was younger. I would paint. I would draw each row. Oh. Yeah, I have dirt under the fingernails, the whole bit, like <laughs> food and its teeth. He's like going full blast. But like I like he loves that though. Yeah. He loves it. Yeah, and you can tell he loves it. That's why yeah. it's so good. Right. So. <laughs> Yeah. That's a good point though, because I know like younger artists tend to, at least me, like I should just say me, because I don't know other artists, but like it's kind of scary right. to be passionate about stuff, you know, and to put out what, put out into the world what you're passionate about, because that's a vulnerable place to be. And it's like, yeah. and so I don't know, it's like, it's a very personal thing to do. And I think that, but I think that's the connection you make at conventions, like even just getting hired for jobs. That's what people are seeing through your work is what you love. And if, why hide that, you know? But I, I get it, like when you're younger and shy and, and timid, you don't wanna put out there what you love, especially if what you love is kind of cringy or kind of uncool or something, but lean into that, lean into the, the nerdy side of yourself or whatever it is and don't hide that because people yeah. feel that love in your work. And that's, you know, that's when you make a connection at a show. And, and then that's when it's kind of less awkward to sell it because you're so passionate about it. You want people to, to love it too, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And um, the thing about being passionate about something too is that you want to make sure that what you're passionate about, like you want to it, try to understand what place that's coming from. Try to understand how you channeled that passion in the first place. What I, I remember what I did a lot when I was at SCAD was I was really trying to find myself. And so I would just write down the things that gave me inspiration that made me start drawing in the first place. So I'd write down things like mushrooms and fashion and um, you know, curvy women and um, just like certain colors and just things that I could draw on that made me happy and then understand what, like what emotions behind it made me create, like what basically were my values of my art and kind of establishing that for yourself so that you don't fall astray too far of like what people are asking of you that you're falling so outside of your values that you don't recognize what you're making anymore. Cause that can really easily happen. Mm -hmm. Understanding kind of a grounding point, a base to come back to is always really important um, to know like, what is your, what is your true self? What is authentic? And obviously you can stray out of that. Obviously if you're a staff artist or, um, or even independent and you're doing freelance you might have to go away from that but you don't wanna go against kind of like what you believe in to make art that you don't, you know 
that you're like, I don't know why I'm making this, you know, very dark, very violent thing where my core values are to be, um, you know, like peaceful and kind or, you know, promote something. It's like you, if you fall too far, you'll, you'll just be unhappy creating what you create. So knowing where you come from is really good at keeping yourself grounded. So um, that's something that I found really important and something that sometimes I have to go back to as well, because uh, I get lost sometimes and finding that landing point is really good for me. And that's, I mean, that's what happened. I told the story many times, but that's what happened with Gen Con that whole year that I was um, all, you know, twisted up and depressed because I didn't know how to make art anymore. <laughs> Cause I was just so nervous that I was, you know, going to be displaying against all these high fantasy people. But then I made a super self-indulgent piece and I was like, oh yeah, I remember this is why I make art in the first place. This is just me. So let me just be me for a second and remember why I make the things that I make. And you always know that you've hit the right point where you can just turn your brain off and make the thing and suddenly time has passed and you haven't realized it. And you're like, oh, like it's really late and I'm almost done. And I just had such a blast making what I just made. Like getting to that point again, is it feels so good. And that's what you wanna draw back to. You wanna draw back to the thing that feels so brainless. It's just like this, like, I was just having this conversation with my best friend like the other day where I feel like a lot of times we think that in order to make good art, we have to suffer in order to make it. That we have to really like, like you know, just put ourselves in not thinking about like, oh my God, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good. Like you have to overthink everything or put too much detail in everything. Where when you pull back from that and just create something that you really are into and that makes you really happy, it feels easy. And sometimes you think it feels too easy. And you're like, why did that, why was that so easy? Like you get scared of it. Like, don't be afraid of that, chase that feeling because it probably turned out really good because it was so easy. It was effortless because you wanted to make it. And we were realizing that about pieces that we had created and we we're like, people like this. Why do they like it? It was so easy to make. It's because you liked making it. <laughs> people can see that you like making it. It comes across in your art. Make things that you like making. Don't torture yourself, please. So that's the advice that I can give because I'm still learning that lesson right now. <laughs> I had a, back one of my, one of my part-time jobs back when I was in college was working as a security guard at an apartment complex. And um, I remember like this retired Walmart employee was just like out sitting with a bunch of his friends like the the wicker chairs or whatever the the folding chairs out in the, on the lawn he calls me over and he starts giving me like financial advice like tips and uh he's like how old are you i told him i was in my 20s and he's like well this is what you should be doing like as soon as you get some money you should do this 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 and this invest in this stock invest in mutual funds and all this and he says by the time you're 50 you can retire and blah 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 and i didn't do none of that <laughs> <laughs> so and I, it, it 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 sometimes it eats at me and i'm like damn it especially back when before this is before Disney bought Pixar, like Apple owned yeah. Pixar. And I remember being in my, no, I wasn't in my twenties. I was like almost 20. And I remember uh, I had just graduated college and I was uh, working for this fine artist in New York city. And we're sitting there before the day started. I'm looking at the like wall street journal. I had no idea what I was looking at. But I was looking at the stocks and all that, that whole stock market page, trying to figure out how many, um, how many shares of Apple I could afford to buy now that I had a job, you know, fresh out of college. And because I wanted to get some of that sweet Pixar money or like if they, <clears throat> but then I didn't do anything with it. I didn't do anything. And then then they came out with the iPod and then the iPhone and then, you know, then Disney bought Pixar and I'm like, oh, damn it. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> so 
Uh, yeah, invest in something, anything. I can say that I invested in Square and PayPal. Um, I think back in, I think it was like 2017 or 2018. And boy, howdy, I was glad I did that. Because <laughs> if you look at the growth in those two stocks, holy crap, it's pretty good. I didn't invest that much money because I didn't have that much money at the time. However, it was still a really good investment because it, it went really, um, I, think it, I think one of them was like 500%. I wish I invested more money, but I didn't have it. So I can't really be mad at myself for it, but I'm glad I did something. I could have invested in Netflix back in 2016, but I couldn't do it because I did it wrong and I'm regretting that every day. But that's okay. That's okay. Couldn't so help. is this money that you're just letting accrue? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So when is that kind of like a little retirement thing? Yeah. When you invest in stock, you, I mean, you can day trade, but I don't recommend that. That's, that sounds like a nightmare. Uh, mm -hmm. Try to invest for long-term stocks because um, you, you could just like watch it and just let it like, usually like the trend, if they trend up, they'll just continue to trend up and just let it happen. Yeah. So um, also one more thing about stocks is that you want to try to keep a stock for a year because you get taxed less after you have a stock for a year if you want to withdraw it. So FYI, um, something I didn't learn until I was at EA. And I was like, oh, it's interesting. I didn't know that. So yeah, try to get educated as much as you can about financial stuff that they don't teach you because they, people, the people who are gaming those markets take advantage of the fact that nobody else knows how to use them, which is why the Reddit thing blew up because nobody else used, knew how to use them until they did. And then you see what happens. So, you know, it blew up eventually, but for a short time, it was crazy. Yep. Yeah. Oh, um, let me talk. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I, I don't remember what I was going to say earlier, but I think hearing you both talk about money is, is reminding me that, um, that like, you know, our careers are long and you might start out, maybe you might be lucky to start out doing what you love at first, but that's not going to last forever. Or you might start off doing a job you hate. And that's not going to last forever either. But I guess yeah. for me, I just kind of wish I had looked at my life and like in sort of like two pieces and it's like survival, like financial survival, and then doing the things I love. And I have to be doing both of those all the time. And it might be small ratio of what I love when survival is like the biggest, you know, priority. Um, and hopefully it'll change, you know, as, as soon as survival is taken care of, I can focus on what I love more. But I think it's important to kind of try to do both in whatever capacity you can throughout your whole career. And I, it's just something I wish I had thought of earlier because when I was doing gallery work, it was like really fun to paint my own paintings, but it, it really felt like a hobby in the sense that I was not planning for my future. I was not thinking about any, any of my decisions in terms of survival. I was just like, I'm lucky to get to do this and just kind of assumed it would always be there. And I think it's really easy to fall into that trap when you're, when you're younger and you're just kind of mm -hmm. thinking life is long and <laughs> I'll figure it out later. Like, try to have a game plan from the beginning. Yeah, to lead off of that too. It's like when I was younger, I realized that I just didn't take myself seriously or my art seriously. I didn't think of it as something that could be a business or something that could be a legitimate mm -hmm. like thing. I just thought I was just making art. Mm -hmm. And so I never really tried to, you know, like when I went, uh, when even when, you know, 10 years ago when I would start going to conventions, I never tried to gather a mailing list or I never really tried to, you know, brand or anything like that. I was just like, oh yeah, I'm just selling my art. But the sooner you can think of it as like something that you can actually like, this is your, like if you're at a convention or if you're planning to make money off of your work, then your work, I, I know that we are loath to say it because like, you know, when you're an artist, you wanna create for the sake of creating. But if you're selling your stuff, your art is a product. There's no way around it. So you have to treat it like it's a business. And, you know, you have to try to be intentional about what your audience is like and how you're marketing to your audience. How are you presenting yourself to your audience? How are you, you know, treating your art? Take your work seriously. Take yourself seriously. You are a business person selling a thing to other people. And I know that's like very capitalist, but if you're selling your work, that's basically what we're doing anyway. So you have to be realistic about what you're actually doing. Um, obviously still have fun with your work because again, that's what's going to sell is like work that feels authentic to you. But that authenticity, there's a place that it sits. Try to find the place that it sits and try to find those people who appreciate where it sits because that will be your target audience. And that's, that's who will appreciate your art the best. And um, 
and you will see that appreciation. So search around for circles that have those kinds of people and and try to see if you can, you know, cater to them or post art in those channels and, you know, and see how well it does. And then you'll find a community of like like-minded individuals who really appreciate you for what you do and that feels really good. So it's like the intersection of art and business, but it's something that you should take seriously, you know, as soon as you feel like you have enough of a voice to take seriously. And even if you don't, still take yourself seriously. It's important to do that. Eric. So I wanted to, and I've probably said it, I don't know if I've said this on this podcast before, but um, I think it's really important that uh, new illustrators or just illustrators or just artists in general have more than one stream of income. Yes, diversify your income. Yeah. Continue. Um, and I mean, what I, I mean, I, what I've been seeing recently with with people that steal other people's art and get called out for it and then they you know they ruin gigs for themselves or uh they say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and then they get destroyed or you know, just you know things happen businesses slow down industries slow down art directors quit I mean, if you are getting hooked up by one person at a, at a publisher and they leave or they die and, you know, they were your cash cow, then what, yeah. right? Or, or, you know, you, you think that you, you found the dream, you know, freelance client and then they just, they stop calling you and you may never know why. That's, that's a lot of people's worst fear is what if they stop calling? What do I do? I've got a mortgage. What do I do? I mean, usually if your stuff is good, good enough, there will be more than one company calling you. Um, I, I, I wonder about people that are out there and they're, you only see one company working with them. Um, sporadically like I, I don't know like do you not offer anything else can you not do anything else um because yeah like like Mia was saying this career is long I mean unless you you know that you're going to bow out at 50 you know you're just going to let it ride uh you know you could be in this game like like what Tim was saying <laughs> these 53 he's not planning on going anywhere he, he's still he's still a competition so um yeah diversify some people teach some people have uh you know fine art careers some you know selling original works mm -hmm. I, there's folks out there making a killing through patreon but still freelance and or have or have studio jobs um whatever you got to do like what is that animation studio blue sky just 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 got just shut down yeah. you know there was a dude working there that was pulling like six grand something like six seven grand a month on patreon he's like all right yeah. <laughs> i can't imagine he was anyway. earning all that much <laughs> you know yeah, i guess I'm i'll okay. dip into my patreon right mm -hmm. but uh that's that. I mean, I, I, I was told that back when I was in college, like, don't just, don't just think that one thing is going to cover you, yeah. you know, forever. Cause it's not, especially if you get sick of doing it, doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know? want to be able to have the ability to jump ship if you need to. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen illustrators completely change their careers after 20 or so years of doing something and they just go, I am sick of doing romance novels. If I never have to do another romance novel, you know, mm -hmm. and like, okay, so now what do I do with myself? Yeah. Right. And they have to completely reinvent their entire careers and uh, look for, look for something else. But it, it, they, you know, the, the successful ones make it happen. So um yeah. that's 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 number one and i don't know if this is the this is probably not necessarily the answer to who to who success uh, succeeds at that transition or not but it's just something i've just recently started to see differently 
but I feel like up until now, I've seen like having to change my career or change my approach is a bad thing. Like the fact that I've had to do that is a bad thing. But I guess the way I'm looking at it more now is that it's you're just transforming yourself and that's actually not negative. It's just, yeah. it's, it, it, you're just proving that you're adaptable, you're evolving, that's a good thing. So if you find yourself in that position where you're a 30 year career, a 20 year career artist and you hate doing that, I, I guess like for me, it's like, like I said, up until now, I, I thought that would be a depressing idea, but instead it's just like you are in your next evolutionary stage and that's awesome, that's exciting. And all the skills you had uh, up until that point will serve you in the future. It'll make it easier to, to transition to that next stage. But yeah, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be like anything, like starting a new business is gonna be hard, but you can do it. Yeah, and, it's, yeah it's liberating in a way to not have to be married to one career option only. Yeah. to be able to have options for yourself and to go between the ones that you've you know chosen for yourself because you plan well enough to be able to do that and i think i said this in a previous episode but what i always like to have for myself is a plan a b and c where i always know if the rug you know gets pulled out from under me that i'll have something else to fall back on no matter what and i had to develop this mindset after you know working in animation and having hiatus for 2 to 3 months not really knowing if they would take me back for a job so what I would do while I was off was just hustle for conventions and then make a bunch of money during conventions and be able to survive over hiatus. And, um, and then I'm like, okay, if that doesn't work, then I know a few places I could probably work, not art related, but it still would be enough to get me to survive until I find the next place and I'd be happy enough doing the thing. So um, I guess like tied into that advice is um, find something else that you enjoy that you are excited about even if you're not like the most passionate about it but something that makes you kind of happy um for me that's plants and animals so my favorite places like that I worked when I was not in art was PetSmart and I really would love to work at the succulent store around the corner from my house if I ever you know broke out in <laughs> I think I mentioned this before but um I like those are things that I would happily do uh if I if I, you know, if I had ever, ever landed on like really hard times or something like that, and it would still be okay. And I would have enough energy left over to be able to work on my personal art to get me to the next step, but plan for yourself again. Yeah. Diversify what you're making or diversify your income so that you have other fallback plans, make sure you save so that you're not just, you have nothing left, um, you left over once something falls through or you don't get that freelance job you're counting on, or that studio job has suddenly shut down. Cause we just, had another studio in Austin shut down, um, a game studio, and you know it happens a lot. So you want to make sure that you have contingency plans no matter what. You don't want just your one option to be your one option. And that's it. Think, find other things that, that that are in your life, and find how you can pivot for yourself. You can only benefit from that. Or you know, a pandemic happens. Or a pandemic happens, <laughs> and all the conventions go away. So that's a thing. <laughs> exactly. I think that's the biggest lesson for me from this whole thing. It's like something that you do not see coming might happen and you have to be prepared for that and figure something out and mm -hmm. at the end of the day even if like and i'll keep saying this even if you know you're pulled away from doing an art job it's not the worst thing in the world like every job is good work you know and it's and it sh should be you know worthy of respect and you will learn something from every job that you do and it will it will feed into your art in some way i promise you yeah, it will it's like, don't think that you're above any kind of like different job that's outside of art. Like I've met so many people who are like, I don't want to work at blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, like literally why not? Like just, you don't, it doesn't have to be permanent. It doesn't reflect badly on you. If you have to work on food service for a little bit or at a Best Buy or something like that, you're just doing what you need to do to make money until you get to the next step. It's okay to use places as a stepping stone. It's, it's fine. But it doesn't mean that you have failed in any way. It just means that you need, you're just doing the next thing that you need to do to get to where you want to go. There's no shame in that. But so many people have too much pride to think that they have to lower themselves to a, a company. And there's no such thing as lowering yourself to a job because you're still doing a job. You're still making money. Yeah, because some people honestly don't can't cut it as an artist. And it's not for, it's a hard career. It's not for everybody. It's really important to recognize that. Yeah, my my college mentor actually said something almost like verbatim, like some people aren't meant to be illustrators. It doesn't matter how well you paint. Some people just can't, won't be able to handle 
the you know the the stress of it or the the lifestyle yeah um and they'll need to supplement that income with some other type of employment and especially when you're young it can feel shameful because the expectations are so high uh, after coming out of college and paying all of that money but when you're young you're also impatient and i was definitely impatient i think a lot of people are impatient because they just you just want to start your career and you just want to get going but there's some people who got out of college and did not start their career for like eight to 10 years. Some of them, like I just, like one of my friends, like literally started like after, I think it was eight years out and it was the, a dream job, but it took that long to get it. And the only reason like she got that job was cause she didn't quit. She did, she stuck with it and she got that job. So, you know, but like when you're impatient you just want the thing and you don't want to settle, you don't want to settle for anything, but it's literally like, I think that when you're younger, you think of things as permanent or that they are going to be like a mark on you forever, especially when you're in the moment, it just feels like it's going to last forever. There's no moment that's going to last forever. It's the present for a reason. The present is literally moment to moment. It's fleeting. So it's just like, let it be what it is, but know that in the future you're building towards something. And as long as you keep that ethic going, you're going to be able to get it. As long as you keep self-aware about what your quality is and how you're stacking up, you're going to be able to get it eventually. It just takes time and effort. And some people get lucky. Some people get hired before they even leave college. Some people are, you know, they get hired right after. And some people have to wait. And you have to accept that your journey is your journey yeah. and trying to compare yourself to everybody. It's very tempting to do. It's really hard not to, to compare yourself. And I think it's almost impossible to do that because you just see people around you. But you have to know that your life is your life. And you also don't know the details in other people's lives. So, you know, it's like, it can be hard, but this is your journey and you have to accept your journey for what it is. And if you really want it, try to stay the path as long as you can and work for it. And if you find it's not for you, there's no shame in that. If you find it is for you and it just took longer, there's no shame in that. If you're surviving, there is no shame in that. <laughs> it is okay to just be who you are and to live your life. And that's the advice that I'd give to people because I know that a lot of people were embarrassed about where they started or how they ended up or what they're doing now, but just you're surviving and that's okay. It's okay to just do what you do. As long as you're not hurting anybody in the process and try to take care of yourself. <laughs> oh, please take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite stories that that reminds me of is of Philip Glass. He's like a, like a famous composer today, like in classical music. And I guess he was a plumber, like, he, you know, it was a part-time job while he was famous. And he's like at the house of this famous it's a music critic that's like, what are you doing here? Why are you fixing my dishwasher? You should be composing, you know, masterpieces. And he's like, I do that. And I also do this to pay the bills because I live in New York City, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, there's no shame in that. Like, but that person was like saying, you should not be doing this job. And it's like, why can't I, you know? Like, yeah. You do what you got to do. No shame in, in doing something that's not art because it doesn't, I think we're so used to having like what we do define us as a person because it's been art. We're so used to tying that into our worth is that like that we think that our job also reflects our worth and it's not, it's not it at all. It's just, it is something you do. Let it be something that you do. I really like that, that phrasing. Yeah. This is something I do and, I, and art is something I also do. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yeah, absolutely. Easy, easy. I, 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 I needed to hear that. <laughs> probably as much as anybody watching this needed to hear that because like my self-worth has been tied into the art stuff for a long time and this it's a conversation I've had with other illustrators and there are some people that are able to switch it off they're like I know who I am the 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 illustration stuff is what I do but it doesn't define me um and I, I always tend to think about uh, like heavy life moments by relating it to TV shows that I used to watch. I don't know if- This is very on brand for you. Please continue. I love this. Happens to anybody, but there was this, all right. So there was this episode of Babylon 5. I don't expect anybody to know what I'm talking about. I know about. what Babylon 5 is. Okay. So, so there was this moment in that show where this inquisitor comes and he asks- captain sheridan who are you like and so he's answering by saying his name that's not the right answer like who are you 
says his title, like I'm the captain of Babylon. I know, but that's, that's not the right answer. Who are you? Who are you? And I just, I started thinking about, well, who am I? Oh my God. I'm like having these moments, like, <laughs> like watching this sci-fi show. Who am I? Like, are you an artist? Are you a son of so-and-so? You know, you're the you know, like all these different names and titles that have been given to you by other people. Uh, but who are you? How do you define yourself if not through what you do? And it's, it's still something that I, <laughs> I try not to think about, but thank you for throwing it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you should think about it though, because like, I think in the process of being burnt out, I know we just did the episode, in the process of being burnt out for four years on art, um, I'm starting to just like, I, I am forced to find joy in other aspects of life because, be, like, because art has been such a source of stress because of all the work that I have to do. And I'm realizing, like, especially after living alone too and being single, you know, just like being completely on my own, I am just realizing the things that, really define me and the things that I really believe in so like when you ask that question you're like who are you I'm like I can actually answer that now and that's actually a really great thing that I realized for myself so how well, so what's the answer I am a person who believes in empathy and appreciates the life and beauty of the world and nature well damn <laughs> okay and, and that is reflected in your work too I love that and it's probably like just comes out of just being you know I think that's cool. empathy is one of is my first core value it's my very first core value I believe in communicating with other people sharing stories understanding where people come from and not judging because people come from all different backgrounds and that core value is all wrapped up in empathy and being able to communicate those feelings in my work is very important to me but empathy in every aspect of my life is what I want to come across first for myself and for other people. Wow. That's what I am. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Like, it sounds really I'm, deep. I'm still a gremlin. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's not only deep. It's like, I, I don't know if I'm there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I need to, I need to elevate because yeah. I'd probably answer a little with like, I'm that guy that likes phthalo blue, but that's not, <laughs> that's not the right answer. <laughs> that's one aspect of you though. That's something yeah, that right. I, I wouldn't, I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying, I'm still guessing. So, but you, you knew it. So that's, that's really cool. It's because I've been, I've been alone for so long that I've had no choice but to know myself mm. is really what it is. Yeah. Like, but it's been five years now since I've lived alone. Well, I've lived with a roommate for a little bit, but for them, for most of it, I've lived alone and I've had to spend a lot of time in my own head, figuring myself out, understanding why I do the things that I do. Mm. So it's a, it's, it's good when you don't, when you're not lonely anymore in your own company, it was hard to get to that place. Mm. Really, really hard. Good for knowing yourself. Mia, do you have an answer to that question? I don't mean to put you on the spot. God, I was thinking about how I don't because I feel like there's there's still a lot of, uh, as you both probably know, I, a lot of self-flagellation that goes on with my art. And I, I think I was an artist from like the day I could hold a pencil, as cliche as that sounds, and I never wanted anything different. Like writer came into that too once I learned to write. Um, and then it kind of fell off over the years and it kind of came back in. But still, I don't think it's right to just define yourself by the thing you do. I think, mm -hmm. we, I think we all are more than that. And we're kind of afraid, I mean, I'm talking about myself. I'm sort of afraid to look that in the face by hiding behind what I do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'll get there. Like not everybody is going to arrive at that spot all at the same time. But I think that you're right, Lauren. I think being comfortable in your own company and not being lonely anymore is, is such a breakthrough that a lot of people are too afraid to go there, you know? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, and I, I don't expect like people to have to go through that journey. You, you don't have to, but I think it was just by necessity of like my relationship with art soured a bit and it I had I was forced to kind of see it from an outside perspective of just like I'm looking down at this thing that I don't want to do right now and I'm like okay what do I want to do and having to figure that out and like and I say yeah it's like it's my core value of empathy for sure but I'm still trying to practice that with 
every aspect of my life. And a big part of that is how I treat myself Mm -hmm. and how I talk to myself in my own head, because there's a lot of things that I do day to day where I'm just like, you idiot, why did you do that? And I'm like, I have to literally stop myself in my mind and say, no, 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 no. We don't talk to ourselves like that. We are nice to ourselves, And I have to, I have to remind myself every day to be nice to myself in my own head, because it's very easy to fall into that, that trap of mistreating your own self. And I'm like, if I'm going to be empathetic, I have to do it to myself too. So I'm like, you know, and I have to reason why I did a thing. And I'm like, you did this because you were tired. That's all you need sleep. So go to sleep. You need rest. And that's how I'm trying to be empathetic to myself. It's a process, but I'm working on it. And I'm still very much on this journey, just like everybody else, but, but it's important. So I think that, yeah, I guess to wrap that into advice is to try to find the core values that you believe in for yourself and try to find what defines you. That's not what you do, but who you are Mm -hmm. and what you believe in. And I think that's probably a better way of going about it. Eric. <laughs> I'm a lost child. You are not lost. You are on a journey. <laughs> if I if I if if I had to define myself outside of what I do. Oh my god, I couldn't even I can't even articulate it the way you 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 have. So that just makes me feel sad. No, 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 no. So, no, like... no, no. I that's that's <laughs> definitely not the the point of of bringing that up it's like because I think everybody has that I think whether we can put into words about ourselves I think that's probably the hardest skill so I'm more impressed that you can put you can be that you know self-aware and put it into beautiful words but I think like we I think Lauren and I know exactly who Eric is and we can't maybe put it into words either but it's just yeah I feel like we we all are a person beyond our art but I think you I think deep down Eric you probably do know who you are it's just like you, yeah you definitely have a who you are outside of what art is and what that is for you just by talking to you and interacting with you I see it yeah like the, like when I say like that's on brand for you like that means like that's that's you as you like that's authentic to you those are things yeah. that only you would come up with to quote tv shows and sci-fi shows and things that you were inspired by you were inspired by all that stuff for a reason that comes from the heart right there yeah. so maybe that's the place to start and yeah. I would throw a storyteller in there too, because you, yeah. you tell some really good stories. <laughs> you're a wonderful, <laughs> you're a wonderful story. storyteller. Yeah. So, um, so I guess w- w- before we before we go, I wanted to <clears throat> to say that I, well, for one, I enjoy these conversations because they're always kind of like therapeutic, almost. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it's, it, but and it, it's really enjoyable. Um, but I also wanted to, to let you guys know that um, I, I've, I've been like really excited about fixing up this space and I wanna paint, I wanna have two paintings on opposite sides of the walls. So like the wall behind me and the wall in front of me here of two characters from Star Trek like glaring at each other (laughs) and (laughs) like that will like be the room right um so that I I I always want to feel like I am painting in between like right in between Worf and Gowron like staring at each other like about to kill each other like that's where I want to live that's where I want to be like all the time when I walk into this room kind of like when I walk like kind of like when you see two people about to like square off and you walk in between you just like back up and you're like oh yeah like that that's how I want to feel whenever I'm in this room (laughs) you feel the tension you want to feel the tension like they are about and you know how like if you ever if if you're watching this and you you know the character of Gowron because he's got the big wide eyes and he's always looking at you like that that's the painting I want to do where he's just like all right and And then Worf which uh, which has the you know the yeah so he's got so then I want Worf to just be like glaring back at him and (laughs) I just want to make a video where I'm just like oh oh like it's it's just (laughs) just have like nerd out yeah now 
Anyway. I'm going to ask a question and we can edit this out if, um, if I'm so bad, terribly wrong. Is Worf a Klingon? Like, okay. I, no, you I, leave, though. No, you go leave that. You go leave that <laughs> in You because you need my full expression. I'm not leaving. <laughs> Complete yeah, shock. Give me a solid. Don't leave that in. <laughs> Completely opposite to the cup. What is Worf? Yeah. Yes, Worf is a Klingon. Oh, he is, uh, see, I was wrong. Okay, see, he okay. is the Klingon. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure yeah, I yeah, had yeah. it right. Yep, you did. You okay, did. Okay, so we can leave it in because we're good. Yeah, we're good. leave it in. Leave that whole piece in. I'm especially not good at Star Trek. I'm sorry. My mouth opened up. I didn't grow up on it. <laughs> yep. I could have, um, but I didn't. <laughs> I liked fantasy. But no, these are these are these are cool, and uh, you know, I just think about the thinking about the stuff that defines me or the things that I enjoy, um, you know, that are a part of me outside of making the art, the things that I get excited about. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all connected. So, yeah. um, but for, you know, anybody out there that is pursuing a, a career in the arts, whether it's illustration, fine art, whatever it is that you want to do, uh, be passionate about what you want uh, save your money, <laughs> invest it in something. Uh, don't be a jerk. And, uh, what else did we think that about sums it up? Figure out your people skills at some point. Work on your people yeah, skills. skills. Not how to talk to people. Yeah. You don't need to be all in their face. <laughs> either. You don't need you know? to be an influencer or anything. You just need to just be yourself and just, you know, yeah. <laughs> All right, if that is all. That was a really, that was a great conversation. Thanks y'all, that, my heart is warm. <laughs> but um, I hope y'all got something out of this too. And I definitely would challenge all of you to think about who you are outside of what you create. And hopefully you can find that answer. It's all journey and we're on it together. Take care everybody.